Stranger Things 4 is one of the best projects that Netflix has ever put out. It took me a little bit of time, but I binged all seven episodes in one sitting, so let's give it a review. Of course, this is going to include spoilers. As we saw from the trailer, everything in Hawkins is going in straight disarray because of one big baddie called Vecna, a Freddy Krueger-esque style monster that is terrorizing the children of Hawkins. And if everything goes his way, the rest of the world. There is a ton for us to talk about and discover, so let me just start with my first thoughts on the series as a whole. I think outside of season one, this is the best Stranger Things content that we have received. The tone, the pacing, the character development, it is all on point. Even though Hawkins is a small town, this show feels expansive and it encompasses a ton of different storylines all threaded into one. Although some of the characters did get sidelined at some points in the season, the villain is an absolute standout. We'll get into his story a little bit later, but the way that he is intertwined with Elle's story is really unique. And speaking of the story, that's exactly where we are going to use in order to shape this review. While there are a ton of little subplots that are overall important to the structure of the entire story, there are three overarching storylines. And we are starting with the most important one, Vecna's Curse of Hawkins, Indiana. We learn at the same time that the characters do that in 1959, a man by the name of Victor Creel decided to move his family into Hawkins, Indiana. And in the matter of just a month, supernatural occurrences started happening along his household, culminating in the brutal unaliving of his entire family and a coma for his son, while Victor was framed for the murder and sent into an insane asylum. Nobody believed Victor, so the story was kept under wraps for over 30 years. So now we're taking a little bit of a time skip to 1986 to see that our squad is separated, but they're all going through the same damn thing, high school. Eleven, Will and Jonathan are out there with Joyce in California because of the events in season three. And this is where we get to see that even though she doesn't have as much screen time as the other seasons, Eleven is still the emotional and creative linchpin of the entire project. Struggling to make friends, trying to maintain a long distance relationship with Mike, dealing with bullies, her past trauma, dealing with the fact that Hopper is no longer in her life. Unfortunately, as you've heard across the internet, Will, Mike, and Jonathan are sidelined across the entire show. You do get some good moments, but essentially they're just along for the ride and trying to help the overall plot move forward. Will is mostly concerned with helping Eleven live a normal life. And Jonathan is out here struggling with college admissions and dealing with the fact that him and Nancy may not be in a relationship forever. While all of this is going on in California, Joyce receives a mysterious package with an apparent ransom note sent from Russia revealing that Hopper is still alive. Things are getting complicated in California, but the things in Hawkins are about to get a lot wilder. Lucas is trying to fit in with the popular crowd by starting in the basketball team as a freshman, while we have Mike and Dustin reaching out to Eddie Munson to join the new Hellfire Club, which is basically a huge d and group. Max is having trouble dealing with all the trauma that happened at the Starcourt Mall. We get the iconic duo of Steve and Robin, and obviously we have Nancy. Max is a key character across the entire season because as the unalivings start to happen, we realize that the villain, Vecna, is trying to target kids that have trauma, guilt, and a lot of issues with their past. Maxine has suffered a lot and she is the main target now. So we are in a race against the clock because all of the other victims have fallen prey to Vecna after a specific time window. The first unaliving happens at the hands of Chrissy, one of the cheerleaders, who is dating the captain of the basketball team and that's how we get the connection to Lucas. The way that Vecna attacks is basically giving you a lot of visions and psychological torment by showing you the worst aspects of your life and the things that you feel the most guilty for. And after a 24 hour period, you end up getting brutally unalived. Through some homage to franchises like the Nightmare on Elm Street, you end up levitating and then your bones snap in half and then you get your eyes gouged out. It's an absolutely David Cronenberg body horror extravaganza. Wild to see that th this is actually being executed the way that it is. But then Vecna claims you in the Upside Down. After Eddie Munson, who is the leader of the Hellfire Club, is framed for the first unaliving and as more unaliving start to happen, he is painted as the serial unaliver running amok on Hawkins. The biggest feat that this season had to accomplish was obviously keeping track of everybody's story and trying to keep it connected and feeling like we are trying to move forward to the end game of Stranger Things. Keep in mind, we are getting Stranger Things 4 right now, but volume two for season four is coming out in July of this year. That is where we are going to get the last two episodes for Stranger Things 4, and then we have the final season being season five. So in terms of an overarching narrative, we had a Herculean task that was executed, in my opinion, pretty perfectly. The music, the CGI, the special effects, everything was on point and it never felt rushed. Robin and Nancy are actually the ones that figure out the meat of the villain's story because they're the ones that went to visit Victor Creel in a Silence of the Lambs style scene where they actually get context into what really happened. But Victor Creel's story is incomplete and it is actually fully realized through Eleven because as everything is happening in Hawkins, she has to develop a way to bring back her powers, which leads her right back into Dr. Brenner, who is leading a top secret project in the Nevada desert called the Nina. 
Arena project. Essentially, we are subjecting Eleven to a sensory deprivation tank filled with recordings of her time in the Hawkins lab in an attempt to reconnect her with those moments and actually give her a psychological response that turns into a physiological recuperation of her powers. Through those flashbacks, we meet a man called Peter Ballard, who just seems to be an orderly at the Hawkins lab that is trying to teach Eleven how to properly control her powers and how to deal with the bullies that are in the actual installation. They were all vying for control and attention over Martin Brenner, and obviously they got jealous because Eleven was the most powerful to that point. Once the kids started rebelling against Eleven, everything goes to shit. And Peter Ballard, who's been trying to help Eleven across this entire time, tells her, look, in order to escape, you're gonna have to get rid of this tracer that's in my neck. It turns out this was the worst idea ever, because Peter is actually number one, aka the very first subject of Martin Brenner's experiments. Through the final two episodes, we learned that Peter Ballard is actually Henry Creel, aka Victor Creel's son who ended up in a coma. He ended up in that state because he overused his powers unaliving his entire family. He is beholden to this notion that humans are a pest of this world. So yeah, the reality is that Eleven created the village. All of the unalivings that we've seen in the flashbacks across the first four seasons at the Hawkins lab were done by Henry. And after a majestic final battle, we learned that the first portal ever made into the Upside Down was made by Eleven when she sent him into the Upside Down. But Nancy is the only one that truly grasps the whole concept of the story. After she, Eddie, Steve, and Robin infiltrate the Upside Down, they realize that you can go to the unaliving sites within the Upside Down to find these spots for connection into the real world. And that is how Vecna is able to travel and seduce people from the real world is through these portals. As you may have noticed, we haven't talked much about the story in Russia. That's because that, in my opinion, was the slowest and least enjoyable part of the whole season. It had a great emotional payoff as we see Hopper go through a lot of tense situations within the Russian prison. But essentially, it's just Murray and Joyce leaving the kids to fend on their own in order to infiltrate the prison and extract Hopper. There's some good action sets and a lot of tension. But essentially, it's all a big lead up to Hopper reuniting with Joyce, which does have an emotional appeal, but it is just focused on setting things up for season four, volume two. As you can already tell, this was a super ambitious project that landed the beats when it needed to. My favorite characters, as you already know, are Eleven, Max, and Steve. Steve learning to trust himself and actually open himself back to the possibility of being with Nancy, sacrificing everything in order to help out Dustin and the rest of the squad. Maxine had the best moment in the entire show with the best episode being number four, Dear Billy. That could easily be the best episode in the entire franchise because as she's fighting Vecna's curse, we end up realizing that music is the one true thing that is able to access different parts Parts of the brain to bring you back into real life from Vecna's clutches. And in that moment where we all thought that Vecna was going to take Maxine, she had an amazing flashback session that showed us how much she truly cared about her friends and her new family that she found in Hawkins. The trauma, the guilt, all crescendoing up with an amazing 80s soundtrack. It, would, it just felt beautiful. And the way that she survives this whole ordeal with Lucas being the one that says, I understand what you're going through. I see you. I love you. And I'm still here for you. It just, it just tore at my heartstrings. 11 story was clearly backloaded into the season. By the end of the season, she does get her powers and then she sets up an amazing final confrontation with Beckna, the villain that she helped create. On the technical side, there were some things that were truly, truly outstanding to me. Being able to maintain the story moving forward with a consistent tone and obviously adding in a lot of homages to the 80s in filmmaking is truly commendable. And it's not just me saying it, the entire internet is. Stranger Things season four is actively being reviewed better than season three and almost as good as season two, although nothing is probably gonna top season one. Of course, all of these reveals and action leave us with a ton of burning questions. Mainly, what is Vecna's endgame? His motivation to just end the society structure doesn't really feel fully fleshed out. There has to be something in Vecna's past that made him that way. We learned at the beginning of the show that Henry was thrusted into Hawkins because his father felt that it would give him a fresh start. So there have to have been some incidents with his son prior to them moving to Hawkins to say, yeah, we need to move the hell out of here. We also saw that Henry was pretty fond of spiders and thinking that they are the ones that are shunned by society and so he found some comfort in them. It's important to note that in D&D, Vecna is the leader of the spider throne. So what connections could there be between him and the spiders? We'll see later on. Another cool thing that we learned is that Vecna gets more powerful the more people that he is able to consume. And yet, why is he going after children's traumatic events instead of adults who probably would have more? Is he trying to make an undead army? Is he trying to just take out specific people that have specific traits that he wants to exploit? All of these questions seem to 
to be answered by volume two, which is coming out in July 1st of this year. I hope that we finally get to see Hopper, Joyce, and Murray return because we did get to see them fight Vecna's minions in the preview. Pero now all I have to say is that this is leading up to the finale that we've all been hoping for for Stranger Things. I felt every emotion in the book while I was seeing this show. Excited, nostalgic, absolutely horrified, and also ecstatic for the future. I would love to see this show end in a bang that it deserves and also give us some spin-offs into possible other stories within the Stranger Things universe. Maybe there's other people like Eleven in other parts of the globe. Who knows? I'm gonna give this show a solid 9.8 out of 10 for this season. I did feel like at some points, especially with the Russia storyline, things started to get a little bit convoluted, but the pacing was well enough made in all of the other aspects to keep it moving forward pretty smoothly. I also wanted to give a shout out to my boy Gio for editing this Herculean level of a video. I know I ramble, but I had to discuss all of the major things that we needed to talk about in this season. If you like this new editing style, let us know in the comments down below how you think we can improve. And of course, what was your favorite moment in Stranger Things season four? If you want to see more content like this, make sure to like the video, share it with your friends and subscribe with the notification bells on so you can get an instant notification whenever I post or whenever I go live. Speaking about going live, we are going to be moving all of the VODs for our actual streams into our third channel, Tropical Joe VODs. This is where you can get the full uninterrupted madness that comes with my streams. Most of those sessions are centered around gaming. And if you want to see more of my gaming content, that's going to live in Tropical Joe Gaming, my second channel. That will have news, gameplay, everything related to gaming is going to live over there. But do not worry because everything pop culture will live along right here. Thank you guys so much for the love and support on every single one of the channels so far. I love you with all of my heart. I love you 3000. And as always, just crack a smile, ride the wave, and I'll see you on the next one. Now!